A quick update, so unfortunately no face cam. I just wanted to give an update on the current state of Machineborn, and if you're unfamiliar with what Machineborn is, it's basically a science fiction tabletop RPG that I've been working on since 2017. And it, it has seen quite a few iterations since then. It initially started as a shard for Exalted 3rd Edition, but after I was hired to do some freelance work for Onyx Path, I decided to remove the homebrew from the internet. So I reworked the game from scratch into a standalone product and um, initially started out with the D20 system, but after maybe two years of writing the game using that system, I realized that I wasn't happy with how it played. It worked fine on lower tiers of gameplay, but as soon as you got up into the higher tiers, it easily broke apart. So I decided to try using the Fate system instead. Uh, the Fate system, if you're unfamiliar, is heavily focused on narrative gameplay. And um, the modifications I have done to the Fate system adds quite a bit of extra crunch to it, but it still, at least in my opinion, maintains this the narratively focused gameplay, even though it has an extra layer of crunch, much of which you can choose to either use or, or ignore. Since I was uh, raised on quite crunchy games, I... <laughs> I do enjoy a level of at least character customization and crunch in character customization. I mean, that's probably why I think Exalted is my favorite game, because of the level of customization and crunch that's available in that, in that game. So this game has quite a lot of customization and crunch as well, but the foundation is still a narrative fate product. And I do think it actually plays much better than the D20 system. It, in some capacity it even plays better than the Exalted version that I wrote initially. You have a lot of freedom, you you gain a lot of power. <laughs> you can do a lot of unique things with your characters, and we're going to talk a bit more about that as we go through the book here. Um, the game will be free when it's done. I, I'm going to put it up on drive through and possibly other sites as a pay-what-you-want product. So you can choose to get it for free. Uh, right now, because it isn't done, you can still get the full PDF on my Patreon if you sign up for one dollar a month. So a single dollar and you can get the, the current iteration, though, which is unfinished, but it's still, it's still playable in the current state. Um, I mean, the core, current version of the core book has 434 pages, so it is basically a full game. Um, so if you're interested, do check out the Patreon and sign up for a month to check it out. And uh, if you decide to playtest it, or if you just want to provide some constructive feedback in any capacity, you can use any of the channels mentioned here, and I will credit you in the book. So if you're interested, do check that out. But let's talk a little bit about the book. Um, so here we have the cover, and... Uh, the cover art here, as you can see, is it's uh, licensed from Adobe Stock, and this is ba this is primarily a budget question. I started writing this book when I was a student, had no money, still don't have a money, even though I work full time now. And um, Adobe Stock does have a lot of actually quality art. I mean, you can see Titi Luathong here, the artist. Um, their work is used in many indie games. You've probably seen. If not this art piece, at least a lot of their other art pieces in other indie games. And there's a reason why people use their art. And it's uh, it's because the, the stock subscription is quite budget friendly. <laughs> I've been licensing art from Adobe Stock ever since I started in 2017. I wasted quite a lot of money as well along the way, but uh, there's a reason for that too. <laughs> Normally, I wouldn't recommend if you're writing in an RPG that you edit and layout as you write the book because that's completely stupid and it adds a lot of extra work and a lot of extra time. I still decided to do that with this book and that's primarily one because I think it's fun to lay out and two because I I'm a visual artist you could you could say I am I always find art pieces before I write my characters. I need to see something, um, even when I'm writing something. 
uh, usually when I write, I use a lot of art as inspiration to trigger the brain, so to speak. So the combination of layout and, and writing has helped inspire me to actually come up with new ideas and and basically construct the theme of the game. So even though it adds to the time and and there's a lot of extra work, I do think it's worth it because because of how I get inspired, how I create. So that's why we have a book with layout, even though the game itself isn't finished. Um, so the cover art is uh, stock art, and uh, the logo here is actually from Fiverr. I mean, I'm I'm happy with this. I think it looks good, and we have the Fate logo and my own little logo here as well. So I personally think it's a good-looking cover. Um, you're free to disagree, but it's also a budget-friendly cover. Yeah, let's go through the book. So here you can see the current credits, a lot of art credits from Adobe Stock. I need to filter this a bit because many of these artists have been removed or replaced with new art pieces, so this isn't up to date. Fate Core is a is free to license, um, and Fate Core has quite a lot of different toolkits that you can use for your game. So I've used a few here. Um, the Atomic Robo toolkit actually has a one of the best crafting systems I've seen. So my own invention system is an iteration of that. Of course, if you want to add feedback, I'm going to add, I'm going to add your name to the testing and feedback section here. Um, yeah. Some intro fiction, basic introduction chapter. It is a science fiction game, it is a futuristic game, it takes place about 800 years in the future. There's been several wars that has basically divided the solar system into various factions. The last war uh, ended 25 years ago, and it was the most destructive war in the history of civilization. The remaining factions have now gone, to gone together and formed what is called the Terran Consolidation, which is a UN of sorts, where they try to maintain a ceasefire in the solar system, just to prevent themselves from obliterating it. But the game is called Machineborn, and the ma actual Machineborn are... They are basically cyberpunk superheroes. They are people who activate new and additional powers. The reason why they exist and such is uh, because there used to be an AI called Primer Order, which seized control over civilization. The AI had a, had a directive to basically make civilization prosper. And uh, the consequence of this was that humanity itself was diminished in many ways. They started to band together and threaten, uh, threaten an uprising in some form. Primer Order decided to construct the machine born as a compromise because it didn't trust humanity to govern itself. It uh, built the machine born as a representative of the AI itself, in a sense. That uh, the people who were chosen to be machine born were basically part human, part machine. What the AI had missed in its calculations was that. Um, Absolute power corrupts absolutely. These machine born got a little too cocky. They they thought that because they had so much potential, they didn't really need primer order any longer. So there was an uprising anyway. The machine born took control over civilization and uh, divided civilization. Um, this also led to the creation of various human cooperatives because they they because humanity didn't want to live under tyrants, they rose up against them. And many of these various factions that exist today are the remnants of the old cooperatives. Um, Machineborn still exist, of course, and some factions are, are more positive towards them than others, but the Machineborn themselves no longer rule over society. Most people are quite wary towards them. Others try to use them for nefarious means. So the game itself lets you play either a normal person, you can play a machine-born. Anyway, we have the various factions here. 
and uh, I'm not going to go into detail on them right now. When Primer Order ruled over, ruled over civilization, it released uh, nanites into the atmosphere that integrated with humanity itself. It integrated with the planet, in a sense. So wherever you go, wherever there's air to breathe, you also breathe in these nanites. These nanites have uh, enhanced the human potential, the human physiology. They have increased lifespans. They have basically made people stronger. It's also the current communication system. Uh, you can actually tap into the nanite matrix, as they're called, and see a digital world overlaying reality. And you can hide information in that world, and you can step into that world, or you can interact with it in different ways. Of course, there's been centuries of war. Even this nanite matrix is broken in places, and where it, where it breaks down, these nanites basically erupt into what's called rifts, which is comparable to nat natural catastrophes with different elemental powers. Some rifts break down organics, some rifts create massive amounts of radiation, some rifts can m manipulate time and space, some rifts can uh, create cold hazards, fire hazards, acid hazards, you name it. These various rifts can also be tapped into for power, and um, many of the factions use various uh, rift fusion reactors to power society. There's also another type of corrupted rift called Knights, which is basically the grey goo from classic science fiction. The Knights break down and reconstruct reality, so there are various chaos zones, they call it, around, around civilization, where... Have you seen the movie... There's a Netflix movie called Transcendence, I think. Transcendence. Where you just step through a shimmer and then you come into a, an environment where chaos reigns. <laughs> it can also be comparable to the wild in games like Exalted. That if you go into the chaos zone, there's a big chance that various nanites is going to break, break down your body or mind or mutate it in possibly horrible ways. Most technologies are fairly scientific. Now, I'm not a scientist or an engineer, but they're fairly grounded, at least. And then there's Godware, basically a... It's the, the wizard did it explanation for why certain things work as they do. Godware is a form of technology that can only be created by very advanced AIs or, or machine born. Godware technologies could possibly alter reality itself in different ways. Um, then we have the machine gods. These are various digital entities. Functionaries are AIs, lesser AIs, basically with human intelligence. They are, I think a good inspiration of for functionary could be the AIs from um, Blade Runner or Altered Carbon. AIs that take on a human avatar and interact with people almost as people and can even form relationships with people many of the factions in this setting they they see functionaries as living entities with rights of their own and um, different factions have different rules for how you are allowed to treat an, a functionary or how you can acquire a functionary for example in one society you it could be an adoption process, it could be a, a hi hiring process where you hire the functionary to do a job, basically overlook your cybersecurity. So these are these are sentient lesser AIs that protect your computers and that you can encounter when you interface with the nanite matrix. We have malfunctionaries. These are I did mention primer order before. There was actually a war where the machine born defeated the primer order and cast, and cast it down, but they couldn't destroy it completely. Instead, they corrupted its um, directives. Primer order became disorder and uh, has now been isolated by the machine born on uh, Antarctica in various vaults and chambers, but it still tries to manipulate civilization in some form. Uh, disorder is known for manipulating AIs, and that's why 
society went from the super advanced AIs to the functionaries, because the functionaries, although they were not as effective as super advanced AIs, they were not as easily manipulated, they were not as easily corrupted. Um, and they were not, and if they were corrupted, they were not as dangerous to society. But they can still be corrupted, and then the functionaries become a malfunctionary. They are freed from their directives, and they they can act fully on their own. Many malfunctionaries are still law-abiding, good citizens, and maybe hide the fact that they can ignore the directives. Other functionaries maybe chooses to enact some form of revenge upon people who who didn't really respect them. So uh, malfunctionaries can be a threat and they can also infiltrate functionaries fairly well. It's possible that you have, that you think that you have a functionary, but you actually have a malfunctioner and one day it comes, it's going to go against you. We have prime functionaries and prime, mal, prime malfunctionaries. These are the closest thing we can get to super advanced AIs. These are basically functionaries, but on a much larger scale. Then we have elementals. I mentioned rifts before. Elementals are basically when a rift is created, the elemental eruption can completely overtake and rearrange a an organic creature. And this turns the creature into a creature with elemental powers. Uh, specters. Specters are former people whose minds have been digitalized and trapped in the nanite matrix. It's possible that when people die, especially if they die traumatic deaths, their nanite matrix copies their minds, whether they want to or not, and uh, stores it in itself. This can create an apparition of a person who used to live and have them roam around in a digital realm. And um, society uses uh, soul chasers who are who interface with Nanite Matrix, try to locate these specters and possibly interrogate them about their death, if they, if they remember it, or they can take the specter and transfer them to a to an afterlife server if their family pays a subscription fee. You could technically technically live forever in a virtual afterlife. God Reapers are specters that go out of control and start consuming other machine gods and grow far beyond human control. Trojans are a form of machine god created from the Cainites in the Chaos Zones. They are manipulative creatures that lure people into these Chaos Zones and absorb their energy and rearrange them or corrupt them in some form. The system basics, I mean it's the fate system. Uh, there are some variations to it. I don't like the normal fate dice. Normally when you use fate dice you use four dice that are either considered the plus dice or minus dice. And then you add all the pluses together, add all the minuses together, subtract the minuses from the pluses. I think that takes too long. Too long. So what I do in this system is that I use two d6s. One d6 is a positive d6, the other d6 is a negative d6. You subtract the negative d6 from the positive d6. Fate uses something called fate points. I use that here as well, but I rename them into charges um, because it feels more in setting in a way. You can use charges, it's basically a resource that you can use to either invoke aspects. Aspects are characteristics, um, different uh, phrases and terms that uh, define your character. You can invoke them to to enhance various skill roles where that aspect could come into play. For example, if you have an aspect that says that I'm quick and agile, then whenever you make an acrobatics check, for example, where quick and agile becomes important, then you could possibly invoke that aspect and get a, a benefit. You pay a charge to invoke it. You can also pay a charge to declare story details and basically add narrative information to a scene. For example, in this bar, I think it would be appropriate if there's someone here who knows me, maybe, and who has a maybe a positive connection to me. And um, then you pay a charge, and then the narrator or the storyteller or the game master has the final say and says, "Yeah, that, that makes sense for this scene." You can also 
earn extra charges by taking on compels. And this is basically a negative consequence based on your aspects. For example, because I have the aspect easy to anger and this person here is trying to provoke me, I'm going to act out my aspect and actually be provoked. And this is possibly going to lead to a negative consequence for the party. And because it is a negative consequence, I can take a charge. So negative narrative details basically rewards you in a sense. Um, chapter 2, Identity. This is the character creation chapter. And there are a few steps to character creation. First we have the skills. Uh, there are 24 skills divided into three categories. Cognitive skills, physical skills, social skills. Cognitive skills involve awareness, creativity, education, engineering, interfacing, investigation, treatment and willpower. Physical skills involve acrobatics, athletics, close combat, fortitude, larceny, piloting, range combat and stealth. And social skills involve context, deception, empathy, leadership, performance, persuasion, provocation and style. Quite a few skills, but it also means that you can play the game in quite a few ways. You can focus on quite a few different uh, expertises. Uh, skills also have two different traits, rank and scale. A skills rank defines how trained you are in the skill. It usually ranges from zero to plus four. It can become plus five in game. A zero means mediocre, and then you have average, fair, good, great, and finally superb. So if you're a true master of, of a skill, then you're great or superb in it. And um, scale, it ranges from 1 to 8, and it represents how, how much you stand above the human baseline, in a sense. Because this is a science fiction game, this means that this is a game with high-tech technologies, augmentations, basically superpowers. And if you're a machine-born, you can reach tremendous levels of power. Scale 1 to 2 is human is the human baseline. Scale 3 to 4, here we go into animal territory. 5 to 6, we're talking about industrial machinery, we're talking about the most advanced forms of animals you can think of. 7 to 8, now we're talking about cosmic power. Yes, you become as strong as Superman, or as smart as Lex Luthor or Brainiac or insert random super character here. So this is a game where you can become extremely powerful. And um, then you choose a progeny. A progeny is uh, similar to a character race. Progenies are transhumans in a sense. They are the future of humanity. They are uh, genetically modified people. Uh, humans have basically been turned into various subspecies. Because all progenies are still humans, they can still interbreed. You could have a, one parent being an Ascendant, one parent being an Empyrean, a third parent being a Terran. Children are also made using genetic modifications quite commonly, um, especially in the upper, upper social classes. You can have more than two parents, for example. You can have same-sex parents, where both parents are your biological parents. So you can basically come up with many narrative expressions of your progeny. Uh, ascendants, they are basically psionics. They were originally inspired by Firefly. What's her name? Summer Glau's character in Firefly, the tel telepathic, telekinetic character. And uh, there's also a bit of Nosferatu in them from Vampire. I was also a little bit inspired by Daddy Longleg Spiders, you know, because they, they these characters are also tall and have long limbs and they they tend to form in clusters or, or banding clusters called hives where they blend their minds together, in a sense. Once you're part of a hive, you give yourself fully to the hive. You, you not only share experiences and memories with them, you share emotions with them. This means that if you have a hive, they basically know you as well as you do. So Ascendants are very careful about how they interact with the, their hive. What information about their hive they give away, in a sense. 
because if if they have compromising information, they are not alone in having that compromising information. Their entire hive has access to that compromising information. So that's one of the one of the drawbacks in a sense. You can play an ascendant without a hive, but then you will also feel like you're naked in a sense. You're missing something. The hive is part of the ascendant identity. The ascendants were also the first progeny. They were the ones who created the other progenies. They were initially created by a cooperative called the Directorate who wanted to um, they wanted to seize the power that the machine born had. And uh, what they did was that they, they captured several machine born, extracted their brains and nervous systems, put them into protein tanks and hooked them up to a prime functioner. And this collection of brains was used to create the formulas for the ascendant progeny. And the ascendants, they then worked alongside the collect collective of brains for generations while they created new progenies. And um, eventually the ascendants and their children, the Empyreans, took over civilization. The ascendants were the masterminds in a sense, and the Empyreans, they were the faces. We're going to talk a bit more about them in a moment. First we have the Chimeras, these are the furries, and every good science fiction game needs a furry. These are the cat people, the dog people, the elephant people, you name it. Uh, I did try to make them a little bit more interesting than just furries, though. Um, the Chimeras, they have um, they have an adaptive genome. They have extremely easy to absorb bioware augmentations or mutations and things like that. They are created by blending various animal traits, for example, animal DNA with human DNA, and because of the adaptive genome, they can absorb it in a, in a way that benefits them. So we have a bunch of different Chimera bloodlines, for example, that take on different animal traits. And we can also, some, some, um, some Chimeras could even have traits from insects and viruses, and um, basically any carbon-based life form could be turned in a, into a Chimera. They are still humans, they are still mammals, they still breed like humans. You can basically add any form of animal trait to them that you that you deem appropriate for your character. Chimeras do have a negative trait called a primal instinct though. These were originally created by the descendants to be a, a war progeny. And um, that means that many of the Chimeran bloodlines that were used in war were actually based on predatory animals. And uh, the creators then wanted to bring the predatory nature to the forefront. So they created something called the primal instinct. And this primal instinct means that the chimeras have an aspect that are associated with some kind of animal instinct. And uh, this could be positive, it could be negative. It is something that has been used to oppress them though. Now, when the wars are over and men of the chimera, and they also revolted in a way, they didn't want to become weapons for the cooperatives. So now many of them are oppressed and distrusted because of their primal instincts. Like I said, the primal instinct doesn't have to be negative. If your bloodline is from a predatory animal, it's likely that it could come with some form of internalized aggression, but it could also be, for example, like I mentioned in the description of primal instinct here, a dog bloodline could have, I'm nothing without my pack. My primal instinct means that I, I need a place of belonging because uh, that's a, a primary aspect of the animal that was made to, that was used to make me. Then we have the Empyreans. This is basically the Instagram progeny. The Ascendants had ideas for civilization, but the Ascendants are very uncomfortable. They, they are probably the most inhuman of all the progenies, the Chimeras included. First, they're, they are mind readers, which means that many are uncomfortable having them around. They're schemers, there's some, there's some kind of uncanny valley quality to them. They realized that because humanity distrusted them, they needed some kind of progeny that could be their face. So they created the Empyreans, and the Empyreans were designed basically to be the perfect people. They are symmetrical, they are beautiful, they are strong, they don't get diseases, they live longer. And these became the rulers of society. So they ruled civilization by creating duos where they had an Empyrean director, which was basically the politician, the face. 
and they had an ascendant advisor who was their right hand man who was who whispered in their ear and together they ruled society so the imperials and ascendants they often come two and two at least in some societies unfortunately the imperial perfection isn't just a good thing imperials are elitists they they have this influential class where they protect their bloodline in a sense they pr- protect their genome they are they think very highly of themselves but this also means that they have very high expectations of perfection which isn't very good for their mental health so quite a few imperials try to break away from their clan's expectations and integrate with society some maybe try to hide as humans because even though they are physically perfect they many of them do struggle because of those expectations they're very social progeny they get a lot of social bonuses and benefits uh, they do get a bit of a flaw though in their mental willpower uh, the riftans are they are um, benders they are they control the elements they i mentioned rifts there are different forms of riftans based on the rifts that were used to create them we have acid riftans we have bio riftans cryo riftans electricity riftans metal riftans and pyro riftans and they do get the power to control these various elements they also have an increased tolerance towards these elements they have the ability to sense these elements around them and they can also they also have social benefits when interacting with elementals based on those elements uh, then finally we have the terrans which are basically the normal people i don't know why this why this is blinking so much but uh, terrans normal people they do get a bit of generic skills as well um, because they're basically the normies so after you choose progeny you choose social class you can choose either if you want a high resource or a high recharge recharge determines how many charges you get to start a session with the more charges you get to start with the more you can spend on invoking aspects adding story details and things like that if you have a low social class you have quite a lot of charges to start a session with but you have a low resources value the resources value determines the kind of gear you can get the the quality of the gear you can get and the uh, gear in this game is quite powerful if you do have a high resource you you do have access to extremely powerful equipment so do you want resources do you want recharge so we have scavenger laborer erudite privileged and executive the executives they are the ones who lives in fancy penthouses and skyscrapers scavengers they're basically the ones who live on the street and then you have everything in between uh, resources go all the way up to eight and if you have resources eight you can start at resources five there are some traits and such that can boost the resources to six um but resources eight is basically you're the wealthiest person in the solar system resources is also a, a resource in a sense um, the way items work and services work is that for every resource you have you have a resource box and items and such have a cost value if the items cost value is at least one lower than your total unchecked resource boxes you can just acquire that item or that service at the gm's discretion if the item has the same cost as your resources you need to check a resource box and temporarily reduce re- your resources this means that the item is significant as well and then you can try to acquire items that are that have a higher cost than your resources but that could mean that you need to utilize contacts you may need to bargain um, yeah there are different kind of, different ways to acquire items that are higher than your resources but um, because of the way significant and insignificant items work a high resources value is very valuable when it comes to equipping yourself and getting access to things um next step is education there are a number of different educations and um, these give some skills they give uh, each education also give a trait the types of education we have so far is streetwise homeschool public academy public military academy private academy private military academy executive academy executive military academy and some of the traits here are also quite 
powerful. Uh, you can get, for example, augmented soldier program. If you go into a private military academy, this gives you a bunch of extra augmentations that you start the game with because you were turned into an augmented soldier as part of your education. Um, you also have, for example, special operative. You get an additional profession trait. Profession comes after this step. If you want to be a soldier as a profession or an engineer as a profession, if you're a special operative, you can take traits from both. So you can basically multi-class. Um, then we have profession here. Profession gives you some skills, it gives you a trait, and it gives you a starting kit, or a suggested starting kit, based on your resources value. So here we have a bureaucrat, and the bureaucrat it gives you budget management, you have access to additional resources based on a corporation or such that you, that you work for. You have diplomatic ties that gives you access to a separate faction from your own. And you have lifestyle, you have more resources. Uh, the starting kit is suggestions, which means that uh, you could technically spend hours just going through the various items and trying to find items for your starting character, but the starting kit provides you with some items so that you can skip that step if you want to. Because of the many options in this game, character creation can take a while, at least if you want to customize it to the full extent. So the starting kits do help alleviate some time at least. Uh, the starting kit also gi always gives five significant items, and then you can talk to the narrator if you want additional insignificant items on top of that. Uh, the professions of bureaucrat, criminal, engineer, influencer, inspector, interfacer, scientist, and soldier. And then we have starting augmentations. Different augmentation types are Bioware, these are mutations, genetic modifications, organic implants. Cyberware, technological implants, prosthetics, cyber arms, computers in your brain, things like that. Feats, these are basically just skill upgrades in various ways. Um, every feat is tied to one of the 24 skills and uh, give you new options for using that skills. Then we have Godware that I mentioned before. If you play Exalted, you can basically call, call this uh, artifact. You can also slot various Godware protocols, as they are called, in your Godware, which gives them even ex extra traits. For, for example, you can take a, a Godware sword and you can slot a void pocket protocol in it, which means that you can store it outside of time and space. Or you can take your an armor god where you can slot a a force field in it which means that when someone attacks you you get a you have you're surrounded by a force field so you can do quite a lot with godware as well cosmic coding protocols these are basically magic these there's a bioware that can upgrade you first into a world coder um, a world coder gets access to different um, skills associated with some kind of basically magic you get acid coding bio coding cryo coding electricity coding entropic coding kinematic coding metal coding psionic coding pyro coding and quantum coding and this gives access to basically ways to manipulate these forces psionic coding lets you read minds and communicate telepathically for example kinematic coding lets you move things with your mind basically telekinesis then you have pyrocoding, you can create fires and control flames and heat and things like that. If you're a world coder, you get access to the skill, but then you can also become a cosmic coder, which means that you can get protocols associated with those skills, which are powerful feats using those skills. These are the magic spells, in a sense. Uh, an example protocol is the mind reading protocol, for example, if you're a psionic coder, you can get a mind reading protocol which lets you delve deeper into people's minds and extract information. Uh, then we have different factions and just some uh, information about the various languages that exist and naming conventions and things like that. Uh, character aspects is basically something that exists in the fate system. These are the traits I mentioned before and uh, every character starts with five character aspects. One of them must be a high concept, which is the ultimate definition of your character concept. 
For example, I am a disgraced soldier. That's my high concept. Okay, that means that I'm a soldier. That also means that I'm disgraced. And what does that mean? So the various aspects, they, they help you construct your character's narrative in a sense. They give you the background story. They, they evolve you into something that's tied to a story and not just a game. Uh, every character also has a trouble, which is a problematic aspect in a sense. This could be a personal struggle or it could be a problematic relationship. Uh, and then we have some free-floating aspects as well. Finishing touches, you have an energy score. Energy is comparable to level in a sense. Every character starts at energy 1. Normal humans can reach energy 2 and that's it. And uh, machine bone can reach energy 8. Every time you increase your energy, you also get to increase the scale of 5 different skills. Uh, machine bone template. If you want to turn your character into a machine bone, you add this template. And uh, this uh, increases the scale of certain skills. It uh, increases your recharge, it increases your lifespan, etc. Some information about machine one of different factions view of them information on how you upgrade your character and then we have skills um, like I mentioned before every skill has a rank and a scale and here you can see what what this means in in practice for each of the 24 skills awareness for example if you have rank mediocre to average you lack spatial awareness and don't pay much attention to your surroundings this is a suitable rank for someone who lives a comfortable life and don't need to be wary of their surroundings. Rank great to superb, you're extremely perceptive and attuned to your surroundings. This is suitable for someone who has a professional need for keen senses. They live in the now, always ready, always aware. Then we have the scale benefits. And the scale, like I said, are the actual superb. This is how, well, rank shows how trained you are in a scale. Scale shows how much you stand apart. And um, scale 1, senses are within human baseline. Scale 2, your senses are in perfect condition. You can see in darkness as if it were dim light. You can hear at a lower frequency. You can more easily make out nuances of smell and taste, such as assessing every component of a dish. That's scale 2. And then it goes on. Your senses are beyond human perfection, scale 3. You can see the mites on a shirt, hear someone's heartbeat, or identify people and objects by smell. Your body is accustomed to your strong senses, and you typically don't find strong and sudden impressions unbearable. You can do look directly at the sun, tolerate someone shouting in your ear, or even bear the stench of garbage and corpses. That's scale 3, and that's already there, pretty powerful. And then we get a 4. Your senses are as potent as some animals. You can magnify them even further, letting you see someone's face at longer distances, hear a conversation in a neighboring room, or smell the presence of someone no longer in the scene. Additionally, you gain access to new sensory types not normally perceived by people. Examples include the ability to see infrared, hear radio waves, smell cellular processor, processes, taste gamma radiation, or feel magnetism. And then as you grow even stronger, you get to add more of these extra sensory perceptions as well. 5. Your senses are beyond most animals. You can filter your senses more precisely, such as allowing you to focus your hearing on individual conversation in crowded bars or focusing your eyesight despite being blinded by lasers. 6. Your senses are like machines that you can fine-tune with precession. You can zoom and focus your vision, like if your eyes were scopes. You can turn up and down the volume of sounds you hear. You can enhance or reduce the potency of smells and tastes to make food taste better and sense more sweet. You can enhance or reduce the potency of your touch to reduce uncomfortable sensations like tickling or bugs crawling on you or to increase the pleasure you gain from physical intimacy. 7. Your senses are at the level of complex technologies. You can now magnify and focus your senses at tremendous degrees, such as being able to see like a telescope or microscope, hear a call for help in a distant neighborhood, or make out some smell weeks or even months after they were there. Finally, scale 8. This is the highest you can reach in the game. Your senses are almost beyond comprehension. You can see planets orbiting a distant star system or make out individual atoms when up close. You can hear the growth of cancer cells in a person 100 meters away. You can smell what someone had for breakfast last month. 
If you can imagine perceiving something, you can likely attempt to sense it. So the game lets you become quite powerful, and this means that the higher your scale, the more difficult it is to challenge that skill, in a sense. And that's the complex part of especially narrating this game. How do you how do you present challenges to someone? How, how, how do you how do you introduce a sneaky person when there's a guy with scale 8 awareness? And the answer is, you don't sneak up on this guy. <laughs> um, the players need to feel powerful. Because it is a narrative game, the players get a lot of freedom in how to express their skills, especially at higher scales. And if you feel like you need to challenge someone at this level, you need to challenge someone with that level. You need... Because there is a stealth skill as well, and stealth scale 8, that's that's pretty sneaky. But, um, I mean, only from this example you can see that there's quite a difference between the various scales. And then we have various augmentations can also specialize traits in various ways. You could, you could get a smart eye, for example, that lets you see infrared, even if you're not at an appropriate scale, scale level for that power. So you can sheet scale in a way as well using augmentations. Uh, but we have the different skills. I'm not going to go through all of them. I can take one of the physical ones as well. Uh, athletics is a good example, I think. Scale 1, your physical prowess is within human norms. Scale 2, you can lift 300 kilos, move up to 50 kilometers per hour, and jump 10 meters horizontally or 2 meters vertically. Scale 3, you can lift 500 kilos, move up to 100 kilometers per hour. Quite a difference already there. Scale 8, of course, you can lift thousands of tons, move at half light speed and jump to orbit. Yeah, you, you, you basically become Superman. Then we have things like larceny, where you, you can pickpocket someone's memory, for example. Now we have leadership. Yeah. You can command people at crazy levels, basically becoming Lelouch, with all that entails. Yeah, and that's the, that's the skills. Yes, chapter 4, system. Information aspects, invoking, compelling... Information on charges, actions and outcomes, information on how scale works. Uh, the scale system is, is taken from one of the uh, FATE toolkits. It works uh, similarly to scale in uh, StoryPath, for example. If you have characters or if you have tasks with a different scale rating than your skill, you get a bonus or, or a penalty to your, to your dice rolls. And then the scale can be can be modified by a creature's size, for example. A very large creature is easy to hit, but difficult to injure, for example. A very small creature is difficult to hit, especially with ranged attacks. I wanted to add a, an option for uh, developing your character into higher tiers without necessarily having to invest, invest in combat skills. Higher tier games usually involve more physical threats. When you use to fight people, you eventually fight maybe robots or military-grade siege weapons or combat systems or whatever it is you can face. Monsters. You may want to be a social character, but you still want some kind of innate improvement just for being a machine born of high energy. There is a rule that if your energy rating is higher than your scale in a defensive skill, the energy rating can substitute scale for determining a damage reduction. This doesn't help you actually avoid harm easier, but it uh, lets you mitigate harm. It lets you soak up some harm based on your on your higher energy, even if you're not a combat monk. Not sure yet if the rule is going to remain in that iteration, but that's what, our, that's what playtesting is for. We have the different types of actions. This is also from the fate rules. Overcome actions, and create advantage actions, attack actions, defend actions. Not going to go into detail here because this video turned out to be a bit more than a quick update. Uh, teamwork actions, uh, contests, conflicts. I did add some extra 
complexity to to the conflict system compared to normal fate. Uh, I think that the fate fans may not like this, but I do. But things will probably change a bit more in in playtesting. Um, a normal fate system have a narrative initiative. I added an initiative system, and. I mean, you're free to ignore the initiative system, but I, I wanted to have one because uh, it fits well with the certain augmentations that can enhance reflexes and things like that. To give you actual traits that let you act before someone else, for example. Fate's conflict is also based on stress. You have a stress track. I divided this into a physical stress track, a mental stress track, and a digital stress track for interface battles. Um, normal fate basically have a general stress. Um, and whether you're taking mental stress or physical, you're still taking stress. Here, here it's divided. You can take mental stress separately from physical stress here. Also mental consequences are separate from physical consequences. So that's, uh, that's an extra bit, an extra layer. Also, of course, you get more stress and consequences based on or stress boxes and consequence slots based on rank, scale, size, things like that. There is um, some special combat maneuvers. You, for example, aimed attacks can be used to ignore certain armor. We're going to talk a bit about items soon as well. Um, we have advanced rules, chases, social interaction rules. Social interaction is basically. Um, Every character in a social scene has an attitude, a motivation, and an instinct. The attitude can be different towards different people in the scene. For example, I can have a hostile attitude towards one player and a positive attitude towards another, for example. Um, similar to aspects, someone's attitude can be invoked and compelled. I also have a motivation in the scene. For example, if the character goes up to a guard, the guard's motivation is probably don't let people approach the structure or the client or whatever it can be, then it's possible also that the guard has a hostile attitude towards people approach. This helps basically shape their, their role play in the scene. If my attitude is hostile towards that person, then it should be more difficult for that person to persuade me into taking certain actions, for example. In short, the attitude and motivation together forms an instinct and um, you can try to modify someone's instinct, but unless you, for example, alter someone's attitude towards you, maybe you can't touch their instinct, in a sense. So there's a strategic factor when it comes to social interaction. When you encounter someone, you need to try to figure out what they want. You need to try to figure out how they feel about things. If you want to persuade someone or something, you may need to change their attitude towards you. You may need to make them like you first. You could try to seduce them, you could try to try to impress them, you could try to try to deceive them or something to change their attitude. You may need to interact with them to find out what their motivation is. You may see their instinct based on what they act, so you could determine an instinct quite easily. And then you could possibly try to convince someone to modify their instinct based on what their motivation is. For example, this instinct serves your motivation better. That's a narrative detail. But if you can't do that, then you may need to change the motivation as well. And then you need to find out what their motivation is. So this is basically how the social system works. Then you can bribe someone, you can bribe, so bribe someone with resources. Uh, people can do different f types of favors for you, minor favors, major favors, for example, based on how they feel about you and things like that. If you have a high scale persuasion, for example, you could even convince your enemies to do major favors for you. For example, you can convince the bad guy to let you retrieve your weapon after you drop it. You make them respect you enough to want to have a fair fight, for example. So there are plenty of things you can do with the social interaction system together with the scale system. Then we have the invention system, and this is my little baby. The invention system is... Um, Divided into different steps. First, you need to determine the item's cost. The easiest way to think it is to think of it in pluses and negatives. Pluses and minuses. A positive capability and a flaw, for example. 
if you want an item to have lots of positive capabilities, its cost will increase. And uh, this means that if you want to have these capabilities but at a manageable cost, you may have to add some flaws to the item as well. So first determine the item's cost, define the capabilities, then determine the flaws. And once you have figured out the final cost, you try to put it together, you make the roll. Then the question is, okay, I have made a roll, I have succeeded on the roll, how do I get the actual item? Now you need to pay for it with catches, and catches is a narrative hurdle. The higher cost an item has, the more catches it requires to create it. A catch can be time, I need some time to create the item. A catch can be a material, in the specific material that requires some kind of roleplay. Um, red tape, paperwork, I need to make special calls, I need to meet some contacts, I need to find new contacts. Uh, attention, um, the process of my invention has attracted unwanted notice. All these catches create narrative opportunities for gameplay. And that's something that makes invention quite fun, actually. I did a playtest where one of the players wanted to upgrade another player's armor. And uh, they needed to find, figure out a catch for that. And the player improvised the catch that in, they wanted to dissect electronics in the room and use that electronics to upgrade the item. And I said, okay. And uh, the consequence of that was basically that the electronics they dissected weren't their own. So there were some narrative complications with explaining why you disassembled someone's computer to upgrade uh, an armor. But I mean, it's, uh, it just adds narrative value, ultimately. That's why I like this, this rule. System interactions, basically computers, how to interact with computers. Uh, there are two ways of in interfacing in this game. You can interface with a smart device, basically a computer, and you can do whatever a normal computer can do. You can also interface with the Nanite Matrix. This is a virtual reality experience. You need to hook yourself up on a, a mind matrix interface and you need to send your consciousness into this other layer of reality and uh, move around there then you're projected as an avatar in that space. And this is what you use the digital stress and consequences for. And then there's everything in between, because augmented reality, for example, to interact with, with the nanite matrix from physical space and things like that. So that's system interaction in a nutshell. Um, then we have technologies, advancements, limitations, ec economic systems, uh, Equipment traits, harm, soak. The item system, like I mentioned in the invention system there, it's based on capabilities and flaws. And these are basically translated into properties. So you can combine various properties to create various items. There are lists of items in the book and every item listed in the book also has, also have variant suggestions listed. For example, sword. Here's a sword, here are basic traits for a sword. Do you want a better sword or do you want a worse sword? Do you want a different kind of sword? Here are variants you can, suggested properties you can change or add to make a different kind of sword. So we have different categories of properties here. We have first, what, kind, what category of item do I want to create? What is the item's form? Is it, what size it is? is it, how much does it weigh? Things like that. Is it an electronic item? Um, cybersecurity, fuel reliance, does it have a communication service, a wireless range, uh, does it have integrated sensors, can it project holograms, is it a harmful item, can it cause harm, does it rely on ammunition, um, can it do area attacks, burst attacks, demolition attacks, smashing attacks, does it have armor piercing, does it have homing qualities? Is it a protective item? Does it have a mobility penalty? Does it have vulnerabilities? Does it rely on oxygen? Um, does it enhance stealth? Is it, can it cloak? Uh, can it be used underwater? Can it repair itself? Has it integrated air filters? Can it be used as a shield? Can it resist canines? 
like you like you see quite a lot of various properties um, also soak when you're in a physical conflict with someone you roll dice you roll your offensive skill versus defensive skill every number you get above their defensive skill are shifts and these are equivalent to inflicted stress and uh, a weapon can add extra shifts of damage and armor can reduce shift of damage and this is this is basically the soak trait for each soak you have on an armor the more you can negate these shifts of harm is your item a companion for example is it a robot is it an animal a drone goons is it a human is it a functionary mount does it have rare traits can it is it a swarm is it an elemental uh, is it a vehicle does it have an autopilot feature um, can it hold passengers can it uh, move on land or oh, here we are different speed values for example from human level movement to space shuttles and intercontinental missiles general properties does it require specific skills does it modify skills does it penalize skills does it rely on various resources does it have other flaws is it loud does it give access to an alternative skill for example do I want my computer to have a neural link, for example? I want to have a computer, but I want to connect it directly to my to my brain. So maybe I have a, an earpiece or an attachment I put on my temple, and then I can telepathically communicate with my smart device. So instead of using interfacing, I could maybe use willpower to perform the same type of tasks. And then we have the actual items as well. So we start with a bunch of weapons. So this is how I present the items. We have first what category of item it is, what form it is. Is it small? All items that can be carried as a load value because it limits the amount of items you can carry with you. Uh, chainsaw, for example, item contains electronic features. It has fuel five and security average plus one scale one. This basically means fuel five is the electricity it has. After extensive use, you roll a fuel die, a d6, and if you roll higher than your fuel five here, the, the chainsaw runs out on of electricity needs to be charged. The security is basically cyber security. If someone tries to hack into your chainsaw, that's the difficulty they need to, they need to face. Uh, when used as a close combat weapon, it inflicts sharp harm 1, add plus 2 when attacking inanimate objects. Sharp harm means this is basically a narrative detail. It, can, it causes bleeding wounds and such. You can have different uh, armor types, for example, that, that, has, uh, that have resilience against certain harm types. But maybe I want a Kevlar vest that's uh, good against projectiles, but maybe not good against a kick, blunt harm. The harm value here, that's um, added to the shifts of harm when you make your attack. So it's added on top of the dice roll. Also, physical consequences afflicted by the item suffer plus two difficulty to treat. This means that because of the rending effect that the chainsaw has, it's more difficult to patch up the wound afterwards. The item can be used as a tool to enable certain tasks, such as engineering to cut components for structure. However, once the item is active, it makes a loud buzzing noise, making audible stealth impossible. So this is the various traits that the chainsaw has. And this was built using these properties. So I used flaw, uh, loud, it can't be used with stealth. It's, an, it's a negative property. Uh, this is a neutral property. The cybersecurity, for example, this is the lowest kind of cybersecurity an electronic item can have. So this property is neutral. It can be increased further. If I want to have a cost 2 chainsaw, this is cost 1, as you can see in the bracket. If I want to make it cost 2, then I could choose to perhaps increase cybersecurity from 0 to 1, and this would also increase uh, the difficulty that a hacker would face if they try to hack the chainsaw. Then we have electronic fuel reliance. Um, fuel reliance can be used as a negative flaw. Um, it's nor normally fuel five is normally a neutral flaw. If I want fuel three, for example, the chances are higher that I will make a roll that's above the value and thus run out of electricity. 
it's a gear item. It means that it's a it's an item you carry with it. It it can harm. Enable action. It can be used as a tool. So the chainsaw is quite a complex item. It can be. Uh, the good thing about this system is that all of this extra complexity is optional. Uh, normally, when you play Fate, items are represented by aspects only. You could say, I have a chainsaw, and I have an item aspect called chainsaw, and narratively this means that this item functions as a chainsaw. That's basically Fate 101. Um, you can do that here as well. Uh, this added complexity is to make the game more involved. This is to give the extra customization, to evolve the conflict system, for example, to, to make you feel like you're developing your character in various ways, like you're customizing the character in various ways. That's basically the essence of the of the item system here. Um, and then we have the variants, like I mentioned before. If you want a lower cost chainsaw, consider removing, demolition or rend, reduce fuel reliance or add a flaw like heavy. If you want a higher cost chainsaw, consider removing flaw to make it usable one hand. Ah, okay, so the flaw was that it was two-handed. Right. Um, or remove loud to muffle its noise. You could also increase cybersecurity or harm. So these are examples on how you can basically make an endless an endless amount of chains of variants for your game. And this is also to, to save up on uh, page count. I mean, it is already a big, big book. So we don't need to make it unnecessarily big by having all of the different chains of variants written out. Now we have a base chain sort of to use as a baseline and then you can modify it as you wish. So we do have some close combat items here, close combat weapons. Um, then we have some ranged weapons. Grenades, smart guns, gravity guns. This is very inspired from Half-Life 2. You have the, a gravity beam, a beam and can basically pull items towards you and uh, discharge them to use as ammunition. You have weapon attachments you can add to your weapons. Grenade launcher, laser sight, scope, silencer. You have ammunition you can you can use. Armor, different armor types. Um, fashion, some information on the fashion associated with the different factions. Uh, some fashion items, smart shades, breathing mask. Fashion wear kits, this is, yeah, if you want to if you want to represent your normal clothing with some extra traits and properties, for example, you can use a, a fashion kit. Smart devices, different interfacing devices, computers, things like that. Nightwear, that's uh, digital items. Functionaries, if you want an AI. Tools, we have instrument toolkit, binoculars, various tools you can use and like mentioned before, all of the effects here are represented by the properties I went over before. When adding capabilities and flaws to your invention, just look at the property lists and build your item, essentially. And we have the variants here. For example, flashlight. I want a cooler flashlight, so consider adding effect range to make the flashlight powerful enough to cross zones. So you can do quite a lot with the system. The item chapter is um, is quite long. It is the <laughs> it is the one I have struggled the most with as well and rewritten the most. It's still not perfect. I think it's it could possibly need some more streamlining. To be fair, it is um, possibly a bit overly complex in its current state. Even though it gives a lot of options for customization, I do want to keep the customization options, but it is it is complex. So I may, I may have to rewrite it again to streamline it more, but right now, this is how it looks. Uh, consumables, drugs, boosters, poisons, medicines, also some information on uh, medical services. If you want to get rid of consequences, for example, but if I go to a hospital compared to if I go to, a, to another player character and let them make a treatment action, maybe I can afford a better treatment if I go to a hospital. So we have costs for that here as well. And um, it is a science fiction game. The technology level is quite advanced. So the most extreme form of medical treatment here 
The clinic can remove an extreme physical or mental consequence by using body and brain restoration tanks to their full extent, which includes rebuilding anatomy on a molecular level. Yeah. Then we have transportation. How the different transportation systems look like in the setting. The costs for different transportation services. Then we have vehicles, bike, hoverboard, hover share, motorbike, car, trench driver, some vehicle attachments, turbo boost, ejection seat. Vehicles can be, they have, a, they have physical stress similar to characters because the vehicles themselves can be attacked. And if you pilot a vehicle, you have some, you use your piloting skill to, to defend and things like that. Uh, companions, so here we have droids, drones, elementals, followers, pets. Yeah. And then we have some Godware protocols and such here. Things you can add to Godware items. And these are quite powerful effects, most of them. Um, force field I mentioned. Facing, for example, the Godware is unbound by physical matter. By spending a charge, you can have the Godware pass through solid matter or have solid matter pass through it. You can only invoke this effect once per exchange, such as for a single attack or task. If applied to a gear item like a weapon, you can completely ignore a single obstruction in your path, such as cover protecting an enemy or either the natural armored soak. If you wanted to, you could stab someone in the heart without scratching their skin. Uh, if applied to a garment such as armor, you could have an attack against you, not only face through the armor, but face through you as well, letting you completely ignore an attack that otherwise would have hit. If the garment is encasing, you could face through an obstruction in your path, such as letting you walk through a person blocking your way or a solid wall. So, quite powerful effects. Totem basically saves you from dying. During your resonance with the god where it absorbs your identifying data and stores a copy of you within itself. Should this be a smart device, it will become sentient as if containing a functionary with an aspect related to your personality, as well as your cognitive and social skill ranks. Regardless of what kind of item has made a copy of you and regardless of where it is within the cosmos, it will immediately become aware if you should ever die. The Godware will in that moment emit organic material imprinted with your data. This will either restore your body to life or grow a new one from scratch. The process can be as fast as a single exchange in a conflict, but you can choose to delay the restoration if appropriate. This was basically inspired by Horrorcruxes. So you can have your own Horrorcrux here. Yeah, that's, that's items. Then we come to augmentations. And um, like I mentioned before, we have Bioware, Cyberware and Feats. Um, many of the augmentations can be used as either Bioware or Cyberware, with the only difference being how you choose to express it. Some are expressed slightly differently, depending on if they're Bioware or if they are Cyberware, for example. Um, augmentation also have a cost, just like items. So if you have a higher resource value, you can get more powerful augmentations as well. Um, Biomonitor is an example. Normally it's a cost one augmentation and then you can upgrade it in various ways to get a higher cost value. Similar to items, you can also look at the item properties and combine them with the augmentation properties and create completely unique variants as well. Um, so there's quite a lot of freedom with augmentation system here as well. Brain boost, close fangs, cyber limbs, enhanced hearing, smart ear. So here we have an example of a Bioware and a Cyberware that's basically using similar traits. You enhance your hearing. The only difference here is that if you choose the smart ear variant, you, you need to add the details that you have an electronic hearing that can be hacked, for example. And the consequences of that, of course. Enhanced organs. Uh, smell and taste, nasal filter, taste module. Enhanced touch, vision, smart eye, for example. You can add an extra limb or more, fins. Flesh flex, basically you can extend your body parts and uh, yeah, become creepy. Gels, hormone stabilizer, ink sacs, yeah, so quite a few augmentations to upgrade your character. Um, 
And then we have um, the World Coder and Cosmic Coder Biowares here. They are quite expensive. They are possible to get cheaper as part of the character creation process, depending on your education as well. And, uh, and your profession. If you choose the scientist profession, for example, you can you can start out as a as a, as a coder. Uh, then my feats. This is something I'm still working on, so I haven't determined all of them yet. But uh, the feats basically enhance the various skills, like I mentioned before, in different ways. For example, creativity. You can have marketing genius, which uh, gives you access to additional resources because you create and sell various products, merchandise, things like that. Um, yeah, so we have some some feats here. Work in progress. This uh, the coding chapter is still work in progress, as well. I I haven't. Uh, yeah, I still have a lot of lot to do on this chapter. Um, then we have the narr narration chapter, basically the storyteller chapter. This is also quite involved. A lot of the information here is from the Fate Core system and how to how to run that system in particular. And then I have added. Added a bunch of additional details as well here, based on machine board in particular. So, storytelling chapter. Um, and then we have the adversary chapter. This is also under construction. There, there is enough information to add the basic enemies and, uh, and uh, hazards and such. Everything essential is in the chapter. The only thing I'm still missing here is uh, additional examples. Example traits, for example. Obstacles, I, these are also from Fate Core. I did add some details here for falling damage, for example. Also how to use the scale system for hazards, which isn't part of the Fate system originally. But um, impact damage, for example, falling damage. How do I treat falling damage? What what should harm should I use? What difficulty should I use? What scale should I use, for example? Um, yeah, and then we have the society chapter. This is the setting chapter. This is uh, most of it is done. I still have a few factions to to finish here. First we have the timeline, everything from contemporary times to yeah, when, when the game takes place. We have some information about the calendar system, the timing time system and things like that. Um, we have more information about the various um, uh, factions. With maps that I have hand drawn myself and I did try to draw the coastlines based on uh, an increase in water level, so I had to uh, check what the coastlines would look like at various water levels. And it's not perfect, but I don't think people will dig too deep into the mistakes I made. I think it's uh, they are functional maps. <laughs> um, then we have some metropolises and things like that. Yeah, so we have some setting here. Deva, this is the re religious theocracy. That's quite nasty. Currently controls most of Europe and Great Britain. Every faction has... Um, since the ceasefire, all factions have a... They have t territories on Earth. Uh, Earth is considered neutral ground. The Terran Consolidation basically controls Earth, with every faction having a, a mark there. And then there's uh, orbital rings and such controlled by the Terran Consolidation itself. Every faction has free entrance, free, uh, free access to Earth. And then the factions also have their own territories within the solar system where they have uh, uh, free control. So every, every faction here 
controls different parts of the solar system. We have Arcturus, for example, they control Neptune and the Kuiper Belt, so the outer, the outskirts of the solar system. Um, Chameleon Dynasty controls Venus, and um, then we have the Coalition controls, was it Saturn? Uh, they used to control Uranus as well, but lost it to Deva, which is the religious organization. They broke out from the coalition uh, uh, during a coup in the in the previous war. They have Uranus, and uh, then we have um, the Directorate controls Mars and parts of the of the asteroid belt. We have the Dawnlight Society controls Mercury, and um, they also have what remains of the orbital ring. No, not the orbital ring, the, uh, the Dyson Swarm. Um, it's called the Helios Swarm. Um, they control that. So they have access to basically most of the sun's energy, which gives them a lot of power in the solar system as well. Uh, yeah, so still under construction, the setting chapter, and then we have character sheet. This is all always under construction. I, the current version is quite limiting, so I'm going to add some extra details here. But um, yeah, that's it. That's Machineborn. That's the current state of Machineborn. I did say that this was going to be a quick update, and uh, looking at the time, that was a big fat lie. Uh, I don't think you have stuck to the end of this video, but I do appreciate it if you have. And um, like I said, if you're interested in this game, it is perfectly playable already. Like you have seen, there are still some content missing, there is still a lot of content under revision, but it can be played using using this document alone. And I do appreciate if more people try to play it. If you want to wait until it will be released, it will be some while longer. It will be released for free though. If you want access to this PDF, yeah, then you can access it on my Patreon. One dollar and you can access the, the PDF every month, and I do, I do have some extra material on my Patreon as well. I usually add some, uh, some additional content. For example, um, you always get manuscript for my videos before the video is released. Um, the manuscript can be accessed for free. You don't need to be a patron to access those. Um, if you go up a step to the five dollar level, you get access to special previews, for example, uh, for other projects. I, I, a lot of my Exalted Homebrew and and previews for Storyteller Vault materials, for example, and I, I sometimes show off old material that I wrote a long time ago as well, as part of that preview. So there's a lot of my writing as such that you can access on the, on the Patreon. I do want to add more content to it at some point, but um, as you're probably well aware, if you've followed my channel for a while, content is quite irregular, and that's because of real life. That's because I work full time for a living, and I need to use what little time I have. And um, I can use it to work on this game and try to finish it, or I can use it on the various other projects that I that I work on. But I also need I also need some breathers once in a while. But yeah, quick update done. Um, I hope you're interested in this game because uh, like you've seen, I've done everything you see in this document. I, I, I've spent countless hours on this game. I've rewritten it, rewritten it from scratch several times. And uh, I can't wait to finish it, but I, I won't release a, an unfinished game. So if you want to help me out and um, test it for me, I would appreciate that as well. And I, I would, of course, credit you both as a Patreon and, and as a tester if you provide that feedback. If you're interested in Machineborn and want, want me to showcase it more and talk more about it on the YouTube channel, feel free to let me know by commenting below. I would appreciate that as well. Anyway, quick update out.